So we have a couple of videos on bioreactors uh, and what I'm going to do is in this playlist, in this short video, I'm going to recap two of the topics which relate to different operating modes and different bioreactors and the second one relates to agitation and shear in systems. And then finally the next video we will talk about the sensors and the modeling that comes with monoth kinetics uh, which will uh, end with uh, alternative bioreactor designs. So that means the ones that are not a standard storage tank reactor. So here you see a typical example of a bioreactor and one of the things I would like to stress is that we already know that these bioreactors can be incredibly diverse. In fact, we ourselves are bioreactors because we produce lots of different proteins. But what you can see here is that um, we see here there's a sparger which supplies oxygen. So the first key discrimination is between your aerobic versus an anaerobic culture. There's a lot more sensors compared to a normal reactor generally, and there are things which you normally typically wouldn't measure, like for instance your dissolved oxygen concentration, dissolved carbon dioxide concentrations, things around foaming. You would see that your reactor is never 100% full because you typically need to give it some headspace, especially when you're working with gas. And you can imagine that if we're working in an anaerobic system, we have both the oxygen, we have the microorganisms, and we have the liquid. So we're working with a very complex free phase system. But specifically in this case, I'll just hone down on the different operating modes because this is also key design characteristics that you'll need to de determine well in advance. So there's three different methods of how you can operate your bioreactor. We have batch, fab batch and a continuous system. In a typical uh, batch reactor, and that used to be the gold standard uh, but now you see there's a drive towards more continuous systems. There's no extra feeding since the start of the process. So the feed you have in the beginning, that's it. And obviously you will need to stop the reaction as soon as this feed uh, runs out because you can imagine your microorganisms will start to die and there's no nutrients available for them anymore. Then we have the fan patch option. And there actually what it means is that you do have intermittent feeding in between. And, and this is really common for uh, microorganisms that need, for instance, two different substrates to feed on. Or, for instance, if they might produce some toxins, uh, or not necessarily toxins, but things that inhibit the growth. So you can continue the fat batch for longer than a typical batch reactor, which you will see in the next slide, and I've given like an example graph. And then finally, we have the continuous mode. So what this actually means, this can operate uh, the longest compared to the two other systems. So your feed rate going in matches what is going out. So you're constantly harvesting your products. And a very typical example of this are perfusion bioreactors, which are gaining in popularity. Now, either the, the feed rate is limiting here or the nutrient supply. And this, on paper, it would look like this can go on forever and ever. You don't know when a continuous reaction will stop. But there will be a typical residence time, and most of the time this also means because you can have, uh, when you're working with microorganisms, like we know very well for viruses now, they can mutate. Uh, and these mutants might not produce the products that you want. And especially in a reactor where you impose some strain to it in terms of pH and temperature, it does mean that even if it's continuous, you will need to stop the reactor at some point. But typically these continuous reactors can go on for months and because you don't need this uh, very intense sterilization process as often as you do in a batch reactor, it does make it far more cost effective. Now here you can see this influence of the fat batch system very well. Uh, because what you can see, the thick line is what happens in the fat batch system and the dashed line what happens in a normal batch system. And the dashed line you can see as soon as your carbon source runs out, uh, the dissolved oxygen concentration goes to nearly 100%. And what that means is if you have an aerobic culture, these microorganisms normally need the oxygen, like we kind of breathe in the oxygen as well. They need that to produce the product. So in essence, that the dissolved oxygen concentration is very high, it just indicates that as, uh, the viability is either next to nothing or is really reduced in your system. But if you have this fat batch system, you see it doesn't go all the way to the top. So you still have viable microorganisms in there because they're getting additional feed and it means you're still producing more of the product. And typical systems where you really want to extend that, uh, that length of the duration of your culture, uh, for instance, you have this in production of antibiotics, which are very susceptible to the production of inhibitants. And because they typically go on for like about a week or so until you actually get the product. So in that sense, fat batch can be a very good option if you're working with cultures that need a little bit longer or if they need multiple carbon sources to feed them. 
Now, the second topic I was going to recap relates to agitation and shear in bioreactors. And the first question is to ask is why is that mixing so necessary? Well, remember that you need that in order to make sure that at all amount of time, your microorganisms have sufficient of the nutrients and sufficient of your oxygen. Uh, because as soon as they don't have that, there's no hope of recovery of your population. So generally, your control needs to be a lot tighter. And what the mixing does, it breaks down the bubbles, so you're actually increasing your surface area, which is why it's promoting uh, to having that oxygen and uh, nutrients available to your microorganisms. And there's two very distinct types of impellers. Um, so if you look at mechanical mixing, there are other options, but mechanical uh, mixing is still the most common. You have your radial impeller, which generates a lot more shear, uh, which means that um, this it would be really good for if you have like a free phase system, like a typical Rushton turbine. Um, so it's very good for mixing of that, but it does require more energy. And not all cells can withstand a lot of stress. So you can see that in this question here, we know that, uh, for instance, plant and animal cells, they don't particularly like a lot of stress. But if you're working with something as simple as E. coli, like the gold standard, it can withstand a lot of stress. So that's when a Russian turbine is typically used. More popular might be axial impellers. So axial impellers, uh, they don't generate as much shear. And that also means that they relatively have lower energy requirements. But a key criteria for, for selecting the impeller that you want to use depends on the viscosity. So you can see that in different tables. So you decide between radial and axial, and then there's a couple of different impellers you can pick from. And that will really depend on the viscosity of the mixture that you're working with. But as I said, mechanical mixing, obviously it requires power. It generates shear to your cells, which you don't particularly like. Um, so for those that are more sensitive to shear, there are a couple of other options of how you can mix your, your system in a more gentle way. Now the typical parameter, if you look at mixing and chemical engineering, is your Reynolds number. And the same here applies uh, for a bioreactor. The values might vary slightly. We say uh, if it's below 100, then we're at like the fully laminar range. And then we have like a transition range. And then above 10 to the power 4, we say we're looking at something where it's fully turbulent. But knowing your Reynolds number is essentially for doing calculations around your power number. So we know, for instance, that if we are like in a laminar uh, region where your inertia forces dominate, you will see there's a steep drop in the power number, whereas then it kind of stabilizes and it becomes more or less stable when you are in a turbulent range. Um, so this power number, which I'll show in the next slide how, again, we can calculate this, these are very important calculations uh, because for that you can also determine the oxygen a transfer rate in your system, and you can look at the oxygen uptake rate of your culture. So in essence, what it would enable you to do is to calculate how much of your microorganisms you can have in your reactor. Um, so this is a key design parameter. And here we can see that in the laminar region, it's, it's completely dependent on a constant. So you see there's a very steep drop, uh, and that steep drop is a linear drop. Uh, that's associated with a constant that depends on the impeller that you're using. Whereas in we're in the turbulent range, we see that this is more or less constant, especially if you're using some baffles. So in the turbulent region, where we're independent of Reynolds and viscosity, you can see you can use this formula to work out the power that needs to go to the impeller. And NP here stands for the power number, which you might also come across as P0 in the literature. Very important formula to remember. So what key messages to take from the recap of these two different topics? Well, first of all, your bioreactors are incredibly diverse. So it depends on what type of microorganism you're using. It depends on what kind of operating mode that you're using, whether the system is aerobic or anaerobic, and so on. So it can be very challenging to work with a wide range of reactors. And then we really need to think about the agitation and the shear, which very much depends on uh, what kind of microorganisms or, for instance, enzymes you're working with in your system. So you need to know, for instance, whether, they're, uh, whether they can withstand shear. You need to know how fast they're growing. Uh, you need to know whether they, they need to be in aerobic conditions, et cetera, et cetera. So I've given you some examples on how you can select a different impeller that you're going to use. Uh, so if you're looking for mechanical mixing, and also some examples of some systems where you might not want to consider mechanical mixing. So what alternatives are available? Now then finally, we've should, done some calculations around the power number. So you should be able to work out uh, what the power is that needs to go 
in order to drive your impeller in different systems. And we've seen what we need to do here is we first need to calculate the Reynolds number because this is very different whether you're working in Labiner or in Turbofan. Thanks for watching and in the next video I'm going to give you a brief recap on sensors and modeling in bioreactors which also include monad kinetics and then finally some alternative designs compared to a standard stir tank reactor.